Thank you, Vivek, and thank you all for joining today evening. I see people are still joining, so some of them would join midway. Uh, hopefully, they won't lose much. I'm going to uh, try and run through a variety of things, the variety of things that uh, Vivek mentioned within half an hour so that we have ample time for q and I'm going to skip in the interest of time, the regular update on the firm and all. I'm going to come straight into performance, which was quite challenging as uh, you all would be aware last year, underperforming by 1100 basis points. Since inception or three year, five year number still remain strong as we'll see later. Uh, the uh, since inception performance continues to be driven by uh, stock selection. So over the three year time period, portfolio performance been 93 compared to 69, 24%. This is gross alpha uh, for 34% stock selection alpha. There's been a minus 10% allocation effect. Now stock selections always consider more skill-based and hence more valuable. Uh, allocation effect over long period of time is a zero sum game. Here too, on a sector attribution, so previous slide was market cap attribution. This one is sector attribution. You again see more than 100% of the alpha comes from stock selection. Uh, some of the top contributors and detractors, uh, usually this is a investor's favorite slide. Uh, so this is over the last, um, coming up to four years now. Uh, you'll see some of the top performers, uh, you know, over a four year period has been from the IT sector. So uh, CoForge contributing 500 basis points, LTI Mindtree contributing 300 basis points. Um, you know, Dixon, quite, not quite technology, but uh, one of the new age companies contributing healthily. I highlight this because these guys had a particularly tough years, as you'll see shortly last year, despite and after including the poor performance of last year, these stocks have done very well. However, I would point out that there are various sectors like pharma, like uh, finance, which have contributed to the strong performance. Obviously, the detractors are there as well, but detractors are much smaller than the contributors, which is good to see. And both detractors and contributors are very well diversified. All stuff that you have, uh, you're all familiar with. This is just last year. Last year performance was weak, both on stock selection as well as on allocation effect when viewed from a sector uh, 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 attribution or viewed from a market cap. Uh, so initial slide was market cap attribution. This one is sector attribution. The sector allocation effect was more negative than the market cap um, allocation effect. I have noticed over my past uh, 16 years of professionally managing uh, um, India portfolios, the time periods when the allocation effect is negative, the short time periods when allocation effect is sharply negative tend to also have weaker uh, stock selection effect. And this was the case last year as well. These are the top contributors and detractors uh, last year. Um, you'll see that amongst the detractors, CoForge, Emphasis, Persistent, and if you were to include Dixon, you know, or at least these three are from IT services as NASDAQ, as you all know, was down 30% or thereabouts last year. And IT sector in India did very poorly as well. We had a fairly good allocation um, in, uh, or, or sizable allocation, let me put it that way, if not good, a fairly sizable allocation in mid cap IT at the start of the year and through the year which did hurt us considerably, as you can see here. Over the last four year, five year time period, these stocks have done extremely well for us. Now, a lot of performance discussion we've had over the last three to six months. So I don't want it to be very repetitive for everyone, but I do want to do proper justice and cover it uh, very briefly and quickly. And if you want deeper discussion, maybe in Q&A, we can go through that while I'll try not to be repetitive because those who uh, attended the prior calls might find it very repetitive. What this is an update of performance compared to the top dozen or so you may call it, or at least top 10 other portfolios in the, uh, uh, in, in the PMS competitive you know, or peer group, if you will. So as the um, you know graph uh, table here uh, shows, these are all 
funds that are above schemes that are above 2000 crores as written here at the bottom. Um, now these, since they are the largest schemes, there is a certain positive selection bias in these as they've grown large because they've had strong performance over the last three, five years or longer. Uh, you will see that White Oak strategy over a five-year period is the best performing of the uh, top uh, PMS schemes. And each of the years, so blue represents above average. The darker the blue, the more above the average it is. Red represents below average. The darker the red, more below average. So we have been in blue every year though there are different shades of blue, but including last year, we were in the lightest of blue shades, were, but were blue nonetheless. Uh, as you'll see in the next slide, uh, this slide shows how we have ranked amongst the top uh, 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 peer group uh, since our inception, calendar year wise, and then on a three year and a five year or since inception basis. So you'll see we've consistently ranked uh, in the top half. In 2017, 2018, we were the second best. Uh, 2019, we were fourth. 20, we were the best performing. 21, again, fourth. 22 is the worst showing in the last five and a half years. But still, we are, uh, if you were this being the benchmark, it is not a fund. We were fifth out of 11 managers compared here, which are all chosen as uh, the ones above 2000 uh, crores in uh, uh, AUM. So we are over a three year period, fourth in rank and since inception remain the best performing the strategy. And we are the only one over this time period who in each of the, and it's not going to always stay that way. And it's not necessarily, it, it's just a matter of fact. It's not something uh, that one can, you know, claim to be able to do always, but at least over the last five plus years, we've always been above average. Otherwise, if you see the second best performing, which is the portfolio one year uh, over the last uh, uh, five years or so, they have been at the bottom of the, or near the bottom of the pack in years 2018 and 19. Portfolio number two over here has again been towards the bottom in um, 2017 and below average in 2021. Similarly, portfolio number three was at the bottom in 2022 last year uh, and also closer to the bottom in 2018. Similarly, portfolio, and as you go down lower, Obviously, the frequency of those uh, portfolios to be like portfolio eight has been in the uh, bottom in 2022, 2020, and below average in 2019, and so on and so forth. Portfolio number nine, bottom year, bottom year in 2018 and 19. So obviously, a lot of you would be very curious to know what these uh, portfolio names are be beyond just the numbers. But, uh, uh, you know, just from a, um, a proprietary uh, uh, perspective, we uh, uh, can't uh, give the individual names. So these are all public data, PMS Bazaar uh, data that we have used. So the bottom line is performance while last year was challenging. It was challenging for most managers. As you can see, uh, SNP BSC 500 was the second best perform. Only one manager last year outperformed in this list of a uh, dozen odd man or 10, 11 managers, and most managers have underperformed. It is disappointing to us, no doubt, uh, but it is not a realistic expectation uh, for even us to have to be at the top of the peer group every individual year. Over the long time period, we definitely aspire to and work towards and have historically achieved peer group beating performance. Now, what is long term? There's no simple answer. I've been asked this question forever. Is three year a long term, five year a long term? Uh, not necessary. There could be uh, five year plus time periods which aren't long term, and there could be three year periods which are long term. It all depends on how the market has behaved during those time periods. And last three years certainly have not been long term. I've always told clients one must 
measure performance during uh, from like point to like point in a cycle and that may or may not occur within three years and i'll share later in the presentation why last three years aren't like point to like point this is just another way this slide is just another way of presenting the previous slide where uh, we are you know here at, in this row and uh, it shows just in different years how many managers were performing better than us and how many managers perform worse than us in the top 10 comparison set that we, we're talking about. Now, so this is on peer group performance. This, I think we've shown last time, last year was very interesting year. It was my career's worst year. And yet uh, we received maximum awards that I've received in any given year, because all these awards are for three years, five years time period. Um, so I've talked about peer group performance and I'm going to talk a little bit more on the performance. So this is what the five years look like in terms of alpha. Um, these are numbers same. These are the same numbers that we saw in the prior slides as well, but just presented in a different way. This year obviously is a sizable negative gross. These are gross of fee spaces. Annualized alpha of 6%, rolling three-year alpha still is positive. Uh, as you can see, and has been very strong positive earlier at 30%, 40%, and now has come down a lot because of the negative year year and having dropped the positive year uh, year. Now, there are some comparisons we've made, even though one could argue these are not fair comparisons, as we cannot dare to compare ourselves with some of these uh, great uh, people from various fields that we are comparing against. But this is uh, to just show that uh, even revered people, uh, I mean, I think there are more followers and fans and buffs of Warren Buffett in India than there than I uh, saw in US when I managed money there. And and a lot of people from India make the trip to Omaha every year. Uh, but I don't know how many people realize that over the last 16 or 15 years, 16 years actually. I've chosen this period 2007 to 22 because this is a time period which uh, overlaps with my professional money managing experience. And it's also a nice time period to have because it includes global financial crisis. Yeah, it's always important to see how managers perform during good times, but also very importantly during very bad times. Uh, so uh, you must, if a manager has managed money during 2008, you must ask how was the performance during that time? Because sooner or later, a crisis would hit, just like the COVID crisis hit. So fortunately, uh, I've had the opportunity to be managing through crisis. And so I've just taken, well, for some uh, such comparisons, uh, people from different walks uh, and, and the performance over this time. So you'll see Warren Buffett has, over this time period, generated 9.5% return compared to S&P 500 of 8.5% for a 1% alpha. Now, this came as a shock to me and possibly to a lot of you because you usually associate Warren Buffett with very large outperformance. And uh, uh, it's been only 1% annualized over the last 16 years. Albert, I must say, it is against the US market. US market is very difficult to generate alpha against. And this 1% alpha over the last 16, 17 years would, would probably put him in the top decile or top quintile. Uh, but still, it is, uh, you know, not what one would expect as 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 a very large alpha and top ranking alpha, if you will. And important point though is it's not come in a straight line. There have been years of massive underperformance, like minus twenty four percent in two thousand nine, minus twenty one percent in two thousand nineteen, and so on. If you look at beginning of twenty two, it was actually underperforming for the previous 15 years. So if you had looked from 2007 to 2021, it was underperformance over a 15 year period. Yeah. Whereas, you know, you all expect Indian managers to outperform every year. Uh, but uh, someone like Warren Buffett, whom you all consider God of investment, he underperformed for a 15 year period from 2007 to 2022. And his rolling three year, if you were to uh, take this dark line here, is the rolling three year number. So at the end of 21, his rolling three year number was more than minus 50% negative alpha because he had minus 21 and minus 16 uh, out here. So just wanted to show that there are other uh, 
uh, fund managers around the world who are far more accomplished and revered, who've had some very challenging time periods uh, historically. They have not delivered performance necessarily in a smooth line. Over a much longer period, they've suffered under performance. Here's another very interesting example, very close, much closer to home, something you're all very familiar with and experienced in your investing time, a lifetime. This is HDFC Bank versus the Nifty PSU Bank Index. It's a self-descriptive, don't have to explain that further. Now, annualized return over the last same 16-year period, HDFC Bank has delivered 15.9% for a 842% cumulative return, a nine-fold nine -fold jump or more. Whereas Nifty PSU index has given only 1.4% annualized return, a cumulative return of 33% only. HDFC Bank has outperformed by over 800%. Yeah, but it's not come every year. This outperformance, annualized outperformance of 14.5% hasn't come every year necessarily. It's, uh, you'll see at 2007, 2008, 2009, three years in a row, HDFC Bank underperformed the PSUs as you can see over here. And last two years, it's massively, again, underperformed. If you see this line, which is three-year rolling period, most of the time it is above. Uh, for us, I mean, for the 16-year uh, career, if you were to look at, uh, for, I've been fortunate to have a three-year rolling, three-year period, which so far at least has always been positive, but sooner or later, just like you see with these other uh, examples, uh, it's possible that that turns negative as well. And you see right now, HDFC Bank over the last three-year period is trailing the PSU banks by almost 50% on a three-year rolling basis. These are all cumulative uh, uh, numbers. Does it mean HDFC Bank is a worse bank than um, a PSU bank? Does it mean now investors should switch from, because last two, three years uh, have been poor uh, for HDFC Bank, should switch from HDFC Bank to PSU banks, I don't think such an inference can be drawn. Neither the opposite inference can be drawn. Just because HDFC Bank has outperformed doesn't mean you have to jump into HDFC Bank. That is a separate uh, you know, decision-making process. What I'm saying is just because a year or two years or three years performance has been negative for HDFC Bank doesn't necessarily mean that it has lost its way or because it has underperformed in the past as well and over time remains one of the best performing bank. Here's third example. So we took an example of Warren Buffett, then HDFC Bank, and now a different field altogether. Uh, Tendulkar, uh, probably a, a favorite batsman for everyone. What we've done here is compared his batting record with top 11 batsmen of India, contemporary batsmen. So who played during similar time frame or over, overlap with Tendulkar. And is the averages each year's average of Tendulkar. Uh, so he averaged over time 53 runs. The 11 top average at 45. So you can call it he had an eight run alpha over the other top performing batsmen. Uh, and many years he had very strong alpha, much higher than the eight run alpha. Yeah, because here his average was nearly 90. Here it was 85. Here it was, yeah, 85 to 90. But there were several years where it, he was well below average. You're nearly 25 run average compared to 45 of the peers. Again, similar, similar. And he had a, probably a stretch of four-year period, midlife crisis of sorts, where his average was possibly below uh, that of the uh, peers. In that. So I'll, I can give many more such examples. But the point is that as much as we would love to have year after year, positive alpha, quarter after quarter, positive alpha beating everyone else out there. And, and I, 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 we understand we have high expectations of ourselves and we understand you have as well. But I'm just saying uh, that in, in all walks of life, it has been unrealistic to expect that out of even the best of the performers in, in each walk uh, of life. And we are uh, similarly uh, susceptible to the same phenomenon as well, that periodically there would be times of underperformance as we saw last year. And while last year was a full year of negative, and I showed earlier that all the other years have positive, but intra-year, there have been negatives, as I've shared before as well. As you can see, 
in a three month period or, or more, a little over three month period, we underperform by 7%. In a 40 day period year, we underperform by 5%. Yeah? Yet those years we closed, full year was positive because the rest of the year was so strong that we closed positive and subsequent 12 months delivered very solid alpha as well. This year underperformance started pretty much from the end of the prior year and persisted through the year. Now I must see this so I'm running short on time. So I'm going to skip what I have discussed before on the causes of underperformance because, but I'll just quickly say that, uh, you know, portfolio construction is an important element. What it means is allocating more capital uh, or basically portfolio construction is optimization between uh, two competing objectives, maximizing long-term alpha, minimizing short-term volatility of alpha. We achieve that by allocating more capital to alpha rich segments of the market and allocating less capital to alpha poor segments of the market. Everyone can agree possibly there is less alpha in large caps, there is more alpha in mid and small caps. So we allocate more of the portfolio here in terms of relative to the benchmark. So benchmark is about 20% in mid and small. We have about 40% in mid and small. Over time that has helped generate higher alpha than the benchmark. But in time periods when mid and small do poorly, like last year, that can act as a headwind to our alpha generation. Similarly, we believe for various reasons we've discussed in the past, not to go into details, but uh, segments of the market which have poor governance have less alpha potential compared to segments of the market that have good governance. Now, over the last year or so, this segment of the market or last two and a half years, I must say, or March 20 onwards, nearly over the last three years, the segment of the market or segments of the market, which we consider to be less than ideally governed has expanded from 10 to 15% to something like 20 to 30% because those segments of the market have done very well. And, and that has acted as a big headwind to our performance. So these two are major risks that we tolerate to generate higher alpha over time, uh, which is we have more of mid and small cap and we have more of better governed companies and as a result you know there are certain sectors that are always underweight in the portfolio like energy utilities even right now we have zero weights psus while there isn't a separate sector but across sectors we hardly own any psus uh, uh, so when such sectors do very well such segments of the market do very well that would be a headwind to us in the short term. And that was the case last year as well, which, which I'll just share as well. Now, over the last 12 months, we have added more to industrials. I must just, while I'm on this slide, I can add. And you might have seen some of the people that number of names, uh, while always has been high for us, and uh, there's reason why, which we've gone over umpteen number of times, and so interest of time, avoiding going into it now. But the names, we have added a few names in industrial segment to act as a, because they often act as a hedge against energy and utilities. And there are some well-governed names in industrials uh, that we have added uh, to the portfolio in recent quarters. And then that has worked well as a hedge as despite energy utilities continuing to, uh, and the less uh, well-governed uh, segments continuing to do well over the last six to eight months, performance has held up better than say the first half of last year. Mid cap, small cap, as I was saying, continue to be 38 odd percent in the portfolio. So this is what we have discussed several times. As you can see, over the last 12 months, it was the worst time period for relative performance of well-governed overweight segments in our portfolio compared to the, according to us, poorly governed underweight sectors in the portfolio. And similarly, it was a tough time for mid caps compared to large cap. And these two together, if you were to just mathematically add them is 27%, minus 27% headwind, if you will, which is worst compared to this sum total of the other time periods. And hence we've had tougher performance this time than at any other point in the past. However, I must add over the last five years, despite having a headwind of, so what this red line is, this red line is basically relative performance of our overweight segments, which are better governed compared to underweight segments, which are worse governed. We've had a 25% headwind 
and yet we have generated strong alpha which as we discuss is best compared to the uh, at the top of the peer group or top end of the peer group right uh, despite this headwind however if you see over the last 3 years from march 2020 to now there has been a one way decline in well governed companies compared to poorly governed companies or poorly governed companies are massively outperformed over this time and hence this three year time period is not a long enough time period to measure performance five year also has been a headwind because ideally you should perform over in on this graphic like point to like point so whenever this point crosses again 100 you should compare from there to here so you've seen a cycle of good performance doing well bad performance or good governance doing well bad governance doing really well and then coming back to the normal um, x axis yeah similarly here small caps have also small and mid caps also over this five and a half year period have underperformed by about 20% yeah and still uh, so here uh, this is index is below 80 and still the team has despite both these doing poorly this and this doing poorly and being a headwind to us the team has generated more than 20 percent alpha at the top of the peer group which is highly highly commendable um, so uh, it, it's an important point i want to highlight the background in which the performance has been generated has not been a conducive background for us over the five years as well but particularly over this three-year time period has been most challenging given the way we manage money where we allocate more capital to better governed companies and more capital to mid and small. In the interest of time, I'm going to jump. Uh, everyone knows about the budget, so I'm not going to spend much time. It was a good budget, but obviously there are other macro considerations that were floating around and hence nobody paid much attention to the budget. I'm going to jump and now spend some time on EM. I understand several of you are already investors in the EMX India Fund. Uh, so thank you all for being the early investors here. And several others are in the process, I believe, of uh, the paperwork and all. Uh, this is probably one of its kind that we've launched because most people launch EM Fund. What we have is, um, hold on, what we have is EMX India Fund. And the reason X India is not because we don't like India, we love India, but Indian investors under LRS cannot, in, or there is some confusion on whether they can invest in um, EM fund, which has, invests in India as well. So we have, but keeping particularly in mind people uh, in LRS who may not be able to invest in India through the EM fund, we have launched an EMX India fund. So that fund does not invest in India. We already have something which is a general EM fund, including India, which we launched in June uh, of last year. So we'll share some performance of that as well. So what is the, um, uh, you know, EM funds performance? So the one that we launched in June, because the EMX India, we just launched in December. So only a month's performance in future um, quarterly connects, we'll share that as well. But in the EM fund, as you can see, the team started off with very strong performance over the last seven months, generating nearly 10% dollar return compared to 2% of the benchmark for 800 basis points of alpha. When markets tanked into third quarter, team generated good alpha as it went down well. And when markets bounced back in fourth quarter in January, team more than held up. And, um, and this is the INR performance because rupee has depreciated. So INR return over the seven months has been 13.72. Again, uh, alpha obviously would be similar as in dollar terms. During this time, BSC 500 for what it's worth is up 11, 12% as Indian markets have done well during this time relative to EM. It's just the last two, three months that Indian markets have underperformed actually by 26%. So between June to October, Indian markets outperformed by 25, 35% or something. But from October till January end, I believe Indian market underperformed EM by some 25% or so. So all of the consistent with our India strategy, all of the performance of EM strategy out of 8.4, 8.3 has come from stock selection, positive across market cap segment. Similarly, when you look at the country attribution, country-wise attribution, 
again, out of 8.4, 7% of the alpha has come from uh, stock selection, positive across almost every country. It is very good to see as stock selection suggests skill rather than luck. Similarly, on industry attribution, 7.4 out of 8.4, again, comes from stock selection, positive across almost every industry, the stock selection. Finally, some top 10 names, contributors and detractors. So you'll see Hermes, LVMH. So we do invest in some developed market names which derive predominance of their value from emerging markets. So Hermes and LVMH, a lot of you would be familiar probably with these names as your family members or yourselves do, might be carrying their uh, uh, very uh, popular bags or other accessories. Uh, and more than half of the value, I mean, nearly three-fourths of the value of these companies in our assessment come from emerging markets. Uh, and nearly 50% of the value comes from China itself. So rather than investing in China directly with all the associated, uh, you know, uh, uh, issues from time to time, it's better to invest or get exposure to China through these two French companies, Hermes and LVMH, as the Chinese are big, Chinese consumers are big fans of these of their products so if i were to go to just quickly you know em can be or emx india can be a very good diversifier from uh, for investors who have very high exposure to india over time 20 plus years they're more or less similar dollar returns uh, uh, but from year to year there can be huge uh, differences so as you can see you know in 20 one and 22 calendar year, EM substantially underperformed India uh, by 33% and 16%. But year to date in January, it outperformed by 13%. And the prior two years, it had outperformed by cumulative 12%. Underperformed, outperformed, so on and so forth. So, so uh, rather than, so as none of you have 100%, I assume, unlike me, or probably only few people have 100% in equities. So for diversification, you invest in equities and debt. I would say, uh, do evaluate investing in uh, other equity markets, be it EM or develop instead of debt, as they can provide uh, uh, diversification, just as debt provides, but at the same time provide higher returns, which debt does not provide, uh, especially real returns as debt has not been able to keep up with inflation after tax. The valuation for EMX India looks fairly attractive at this time. Um, at least the discount is at uh, one of its widest. So what this slide is here is the average, on average 20 years, um, EMX India has traded at a 28% discount to Indian multiple. Right now it is at 51% discount. Yeah, so it is like a two standard deviation or more because one standard deviation is about 35% or so here. Yeah. It is more than two standard deviation discount uh, compared to the longer term uh, averages. And similarly here, you can see a discount to the world, not just to India, but a world which is predominantly developed world is at 35% compared to the 20 year average of 27%. So at least it is towards the lower end of the historical valuation range. Um, um, that's something that one can say from these numbers. MSCI EM's valuation relative to its own self, if you see, is close to its trading at just under 12 times PE, which is similar to its long-term average. And on price to book, it's trading at about 1.35 times, uh, which is somewhat lower than the 1.5 times multiple that is traded on average. Obviously, these multiples are much lower, about half as much as that of uh, India, which is what is evident from this 51%. What is That is what is meant by this 51% discount that the multiple is half as much for what it's worth. This graph shows the where are the diff various EM markets, Turkey towards, obviously there are a lot of problems with Turkey, but it's at its lower end, Hungary, and most of the countries you'll see are towards the lower end of their historical multiple range. Uh, India uh, is towards the upper end or in the upper quartile, 
and there are a few other markets like Kuwait, Thailand, which are there in the upper end, but otherwise most markets are towards the lower end, or whether you look at it on price to book or on P multiples. Um, just uh, EM's performance over the last 30 years relative to developed world shows that right now it is close to the all-time bottom in terms of performance relative to developed world. This is what our portfolio, EMX India portfolio looks like from a sectoral weight perspective, similar to India where we don't own any energy or utilities. We don't own energy utilities here as well, pretty much for similar reasons because they tend to be owned by government governments like Petrobras, PetroChina, whatnot, or otherwise there are some governance challenges. We have considerable uh, uh, investments in consumer discretionary IT and so on and so forth. From a regional weight perspective, we are pretty balanced, 75% in Asia, X India, and we have a 27% investment in developed world. So this, so on a basis country of domicile, Asia is only 56% and developed world is 27%. But when you adjust for the economic value, where is it being derived from? You see that 75% um, of it comes from Asia as a LVMH and Hermes and all, as I mentioned they have substantial exposure to Asia. Uh, these are some of the top names in the portfolio. Several of these names, I assume, would be familiar because they're household names globally, not just in um, their respective countries. TSMC, half a trillion dollar market cap. It is the source of the geopolitical tension between China and US. Just like Middle East, always people believe the reason US is interested or the, the reason Middle East is um, source of geopolitical tension is because of the oil reserves. Similarly, T uh, Taiwan is in the midst of the storm because of TSMC's capabilities. They are uh, without doubt the leader in leading edge uh, semiconductor and chip manufacturing. Samsung is the Korean giant that we all are familiar with along with TSMC. You know, every phone that you use, uh, be it Android or Apple or anything, they, Every phone has both TSMC and Samsung components of fairly uh, considerable degree uh, in them. We talked about LVMH and Hermes, the fashion goods companies. Um, these are also amongst the top names in the portfolio. So there are a lot of great business franchises around the world, which are very different from India, which you can get exposure to uh, through investment in a uh, EM uh, uh, fund like uh, ours. Uh, we talked about, you know, and these are in technology, like India has a lot of IT services companies, but nothing in technology, hardware, whereas Taiwan and Korea, TSMC, Samsung are the leaders in um, very complementary uh, parts of technology. Hermes, Louis Vuitton, we already talked about, so I'll skip um, these individual names. ASML um, is again a Dutch company which is center of, um, you know, not controversy, but attention because it produces the equipment which allows companies like TSMC and Samsung to produce the very high end chip. And American government is very, uh, has worked closely with a Dutch government to ensure that ASML does not sell the technology to uh, China. So that, that, that's the nature of the technology that uh, it's considered so crucial uh, 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 in terms of uh, the chip supply chain. And, and food chain, if you will. So I'm just going to stop here as I'm mindful of time. We have uh, taken up 45 minutes nearly. I'll just take a minute here to say the portfolio composition. As you can see in the portfolio, uh, while in the benchmark, 75% in Asia, in the strategy, 56% is directly. So it seems minus 19%, but if you include Weights like LVMH and all, it will be 75%. Similarly, in China, the benchmark has 38%. Direct investment is only 26 for us. So it seems like minus 13%, but then including companies like LV and Hermes, we have uh, adequate exposure to the Chinese. So we have exposure to the Chinese consumer, which is desirable, but at the same time, we have less exposure to the um, Chinese regulations or uh, Chinese government, if you will. Overall, um, you know, we are more exposed to democratic countries. So in MSCI XCM, 50% is roughly democratic countries, 50 are authoritarian countries. 
in our portfolio, it's 74 and 25 with hardly any exposure to Middle East and so on. And same as in India, uh, while in the benchmark, 20% of the market is in SOEs or government-owned companies, in our portfolio, that exposure is only 1%.